Okay, let's let's let our worship group know how much we appreciate them. Amen. One of our uh, one of our young people has just uh, been taken to the hospital for examination. Um, let's let's stand up and pray. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you're a loving God. And that's why we love to come before you with any situations, because we know that you love us and you'll move on our behalf before, because you're a faithful God. Father, I thank and I praise you, and I com we command you that in the name of Jesus, you take your hands off of this young man now in Jesus, that in Jesus' name, Father, that the devil, we cancel every demonic assignment, Father, Anything that the devil has come up with, Father, we break it now in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. And Father, we thank you that you supernaturally have intervened even now. You are supernaturally intervened, Father. And whatever the enemy meant for evil, you're now turning it around. And you're going to get the glory for this breakthrough in that young man's situation. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Before you're seated. Give somebody a high five and tell them how happy you are to see them here at church. It is with all of my heart that I am determined to end this series. This is part eight of Prevailing Prayer. But can I ask you something? Since we started this series, I'll wait till some of the movement is down. Since we started this series, have you begun to prevail for anything or anyone? I mean, really prevailing. I, I, I pray that you have because prevailing prayer is one of the greatest secrets that God has for us. Now, I'm not talking about praying. You need to pray. But I, while I'm there, let me say this. If you don't have a regular praying life, you don't know how to prevail in prayer. You must have a daily, diligent prayer life. Then you'll understand prevailing prayer. You can't, you can't skip on this. You, 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 you must pray. And I'm not talking about praying to Little angels in diapers going around shooting arrows and, and, and little fat guys, you know, and with curly blonde hair. And, and no, I'm, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about getting in the battle and declaring, and declaring the victory that God has already given you and not quit declaring it until you see it come to pass. Can you say amen? And so we pick up on, on, on part eight, and we've been talking about some characteristics or the characters of prevailing prayer. And last week or two weeks or whatever it was, we left off on point number three, which is of utmost importance. In order, in order to prevail and, and, and to break through in prevailing prayer, point number three, you must see with the eyes of faith. Say that. Say it again. You must see with the eyes of faith. Why? The eyes of faith is your vision for your victory. The eyes of faith is your vision for your victory. See, you, you, won't, you won't prevail. You won't prevail if you have no vision for what you're prevailing for. You will prevail if you're prevailing for the salvation of your husband or your wife or your children or a friend. You will not prevail until in your spirit you, you have a vision of seeing them saved. Oh, hear me, somebody. You're not, you're not gonna, you're not gonna prevail if you're if if you're prevailing in prayer for somebody that's battling in their bodies. Let's say somebody that the doctor said has cancer, and you've chosen to prevail in prayer on their behalf, then in order for you to prevail, you must see them not. With cancer, you must see them healed because that's the vision. And, 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 and that's what you chase when you prevail in prayer. You chase the vision that God gives you. Can you say amen? Turn to somebody and say, learn to chase the vision. Tell them. You will not prevail. It's in your business. It's in your ministry. 
It's in your marriage. Your marriage will not prevail and your marriage will not succeed if, if the spiritual head of that household has no vision for the marriage. Or, that, or has no vision for the ministry. So in order to prevail in prayer, you must not see with through your own eyes because in the natural, all your own eyes are going to show you is all that they can see. Vision requires to go beyond what you see and concentrate what your natural eye doesn't see but what your eye of faith sees which is the vision that God has given you and you prevail for the vision. You must go beyond what you see with the natural eye. You must see your children saved. You must see yourself healed. You must see your husband or your wife delivered. You must see your business growing. You must see yourself graduating from college. You must see yourself succeeding in life. You must see yourself prospering. Well, I, 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 I don't look like it now. Go beyond what you look now. Chase the vision. Somebody shout, chase the vision. Turn to somebody and say, are you getting this? You know, you know, rappers, rappers that, that, that rap uh, 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 about what's going on in their neighborhood. That's all they rap about. You know why? Because they can't get out of that neighborhood. They don't know that if you get out of this neighborhood that you see with a natural eye, not, not everywhere is, 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 is going through what this little four square block is going through. Somebody shout vision. So in order to prevail, whatever it is you're believing God for, you must see through the eyes of faith. Well, I know what the Word of God says, but you know, I feel like you can't go by your feelings. Your feelings will not allow you to prevail. Oftentimes it's your feelings and your emotions that become your greatest enemy. It's great to have emotions. It's great to have feelings. I believe they're all God-given. Can you say it, man? I mean, it feels good to feel good, amen? But when it comes to prevailing, when it comes to prevailing, there comes a time that you set your feelings and you set your emotions aside. You don't abandon them. You set them aside so that you can chase the vision, not how you feel. Somebody shout, chase the vision. And that's why a lot of people prevail in prayer because they chase the vision, not the situation. You are here. You are here. You are here listening to the Word of God because somebody didn't give up on you in prevailing prayer. Now, you weren't acting right, but they looked beyond that and they, they chased the vision. And the fact that you're here means they prevailed in prayer and the vision came to pass it might have been your mom your grandmother a neighbor a friend it doesn't matter they didn't chase you they chased the vision god gave them for you when you chase the vision that god gives you for somebody in prevailing prayer that means you don't criticize them that means you don't condemn them that means you look beyond that and say, okay, I see what they're doing now, but I know what God showed me. I see what, I see what they're saying. I see what they're doing, but I know what God chose me, so I'm not going to chase what they're doing. I'm going to chase the vision that God showed me about them. The next thing is, if you're going to do that, you got to love them, not like them. No, 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 look at me, look at me. Look at me. you got to love them the way Christ loves you. Or you're not going to prevail in anything. It'll be a matter of weeks before you give up or you quit. Aren't you glad God didn't quit on you? Oh, come on. While you were yet sinning, God died. Christ died for you. Hallelujah. You were getting worse, and yet Jesus still went to the cross on your behalf. Somebody shout the eyes of faith. Say vision. 
And so we went to Proverbs 29, 18. You, 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 you remember that where there is no vision, the people perish, but he who keeps the law Blessed is he who keeps the law. And we saw that the verse might be translated where there is no vision, the people disintegrate and fall apart in the middle of their prevailing. In other words, they, 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 they quit. They quit. I put something on the slide. Is this the next slide that says, um, yes, look, read that. Everything begins with vision. Say that again. Say it again. Let me read the rest. Everything begins with vision. You will, you will be what you see. But what you do not see, you cannot be. You will become what you behold. But what you do not behold, you cannot become. You have no vision. You know, I want to be a good wife. Get that vision. I want to be a better husband. Get the vision. I want to be a better student. Get the vision. Get the vision. Because what you do not see, you cannot become. And that's when people fall apart. That's when people's dreams disintegrate desires disintegrate because they have no they have no vision for it what does no no vision means no vision means that men do not see the high and holy one lifted up so we're limited to our little horizons we're limited to our little plans no vision hear this no vision is the natural human condition Having no vision is a natural human condition. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 2.14. I, I want you to see this. On the count of three, let's read that together really loud. Ready? One, two, three. But the natural man, come on, one, two, three, read. But the natural man, oh, so, <laughs> oh, you're not funny. So we fix our eyes, come on, so we fix our eyes on we fix our eyes on, we fix our eyes on not what is seen with the natural eye, but on what is what? On what you can't see, the vision. What you cannot see with the natural eye is spiritual. That's the vision. What you can see with the natural eye is what the situation or the circumstance is. So we fix our, uh, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is not seen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is not seen is what? Is what? Meaning that whatever you see with the natural eye is subject to change. I see my, my I see my husband drinking, subject to change. If you see with a natural eye, it's subject to change. Well, I see my kids doing this, that's subject to change. Whatever you see with a natural eye is temporary. It's temporary. It is subject to change. Say subject to change. Subject to change. Understand. Understand. Every prayer battle that you engage in must have a vision from God. It must have a vision from God. It is, it is one of the conditions that must be met before you even begin praying. You must have a vision of what you're going to prevail for. Some of you say you're prevailing for something. You must have that vision before you even now remember, I'm talking about spiritual warfare prayer. I'm not talking about now I lay me down to sleep. Amen? Before you even begin, you must have a vision of what it is that you want to be prayed or that you want to prevail through. I love that. One of, the, one of the critical conditions, you must have a vision before you begin. In other words, you ask God to give you the vision he has for that particular victory because God does have a vision for whatever it is you're going to prevail for. God has a vision for it. Somebody say God has a vision for it. Are you okay? 
Are you happy? Turn to your neighbor and ask him, are you happy? But please understand, hear this. Please understand, in prevailing prayer, say prevailing prayer. Say it like you mean it. But in prevailing prayer, hear this, hear this. You must believe in and chase the vision. Your focus must be on the end result and not on the circumstances, whatever they might be. When you prevail, you got to see the end result. There's a time that you might buy a house and all of a sudden you decide you're going to redo the inside of the house and it's a hassle, man. For weeks, maybe months, you come home and there's sawdust everywhere, there's dust everywhere, everything's dirty. You got plastic hanging up everywhere and you come in, you just, man, you know, how, how much longer? And, 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 and what gets you over that that attitude is no matter what it looks like now I have a vision of what it's going to look like after it's done so no matter what my husband looks like or my kids my ministry my business I'm going to prevail and, and, and I don't care what it looks like now because I have a vision of what it's going to be like because God promised and God is faithful so I'm not going to come in and complain I'm going to come in and as bad as it looks thank you Father for the victory over this situation oh God please hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is not seen. Let me read it to you this way, can I? While we look not at the things which are seen, while we aim not at the things which are seen, while we do not make the things which are seen our object, we are not striving to obtain the things which are seen, for they are not worthy the pursuit, one translation says. The things that you see when you're prevailing in prayer, you got to understand they're not worthy the pursuit. What does that mean? They're not worthy you standing there and complaining and murmuring and telling everybody about it. It's not worth it. If you have the vision, you go beyond that. Vision even changes how you speak about the situation. Well, you know, the doctor said that, you no, 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 here's your vision. No, by his stripes, I'm healed. Well, I, I don't, I, 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 you don't look that way. I know you, you're looking through the natural eye. I'm speaking through the eye of faith and the vision that God has given me because what you see through the natural eye is temporal. It's subject to change. And God, God's already changed that cancer. He changed it over 2,000 years ago to a healing. So I'm not, I don't have cancer. I'm healed by his stripes. I am healed. Oh, help me, somebody. Well, you know, that sounds strange. It does sound strange. When God gives you a vision and you chase that vision, you're going to be somebody strange. Ain't nobody going to want to hang out with you. They like to complain. They, they like drama. You don't believe me? Look at Facebook. Look at Snack Shack and all of those things. No, no, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Why are you looking at everybody else? Look at me. I see people talk more about their situations on social media than they do about what God says about that situation. Well, I don't know. You know, I don't want to go out there, man. I, you know, I go out there. That sounds weird. And, 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 and you know, and I get on that and people are going to think I am weird. You are weird. You're not like everybody else. You're a king's kid. Hallelujah. A king does not think like a slave. And an eagle doesn't think like a turkey. And some of you that want to be eagles, you'll never be an eagle until you get rid of your turkey friends. That's a pretty good word right there. While we look not at the things which are seen, Another translation is this. Well, we look not at the things which are seen because, because those things that are seen, they are objects to which the natural eye can reach and they are temporary. They are, they are to have a short duration. What you see with the natural eye, once you have a vision, that thing's going to change. The duration of that thing is short. It's subject to change. It is short and it must end. 
the translation says. What you see with a natural eye, but you have a vision in your spirit. What you see with a natural eye is, has a short duration and it must change. Your, hub, your husband must change. Your health must change. Your finances must change. Your, your, your ministry must change. It must. That's the attitude of one that's prevailing in prayer. <laughs> Be nice. Okay. You cannot say you're prevailing prayer and go about with if it's God's will attitude. If you don't know the will of God for the situation, don't begin to prevail until you find out what the will of God is. If you don't believe that it is God's will for you to be healed, then don't start prevailing in that way. You're not going to last anyway. If you don't believe that it's God's will for your marriage to be uh, 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 um, uh, healed or your ministry to be restored or your finances, if you really don't believe that, then don't even venture out to prevail. It's not worth it for you to go what you're going to go through. We're instructed in the word of God. Are you okay? Can I go on? Can I go on? Thank you, all three. We are instructed in the word of God. Listen, listen. We're instructed in the word of God to look at those things which cannot be seen with a natural eye. Well, how does one do, do that, preacher? How does one do that? The answer is vision. Vision. Well, I see. I, I have 20-20 vision. No, no, no. Listen. They asked Helen Keller, and I shared this with you before. They asked Helen Keller, uh, in her opinion, was there anything worse than being blind? And she said, yes. There's one thing that's worse than being blind is to have sight but have no vision. To have sight but to have no vision. The answer is vision. But how do I do that, preacher? Look at 1 Peter 1.8. 1 Peter 1.8, please. Look, read this carefully. Though you have, it's talking about the Lord. Listen, you, you want to know how do I do that? You've been doing it all along. Look, though you have not seen him talking about the Lord. Look, look, look. You love him. You haven't seen him. But you love him. Well, how can you love someone you cannot see? Vision. You have a vision of Jesus, don't you? How many of you have a vision of Jesus? So you're able to love him, though you can't see him here. You can still love him because you have vision. Oh, God, look at this. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. What are you so happy about someone you cannot see? How can you come here and praise and worship someone that you cannot see with a natural eye? Because I have a vision, preacher. I have a vision of Jesus. And I have a vision of heaven. And I have a vision of my name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I come in here and I praise him and I worship him. But you don't see him with a natural eye. No, I see him with the eye of faith. I have vision. So now you understand the just shall live by faith well, I don't know if I have that faith is your name in the last book of life yes how do you know have you seen it well no I believe you believe you believe what I believe the word of God so what does the word of God say about your situation well I know what the word says but no a, when it comes to the things of God, tell your neighbor you got to get that butt out of the way. Come on, come on, tell somebody you got to get that butt out of the way. Tell them your butt can become an enemy to prevailing prayer. Tell them, tell them. B U T, but just for the record. Can you say amen? Though you have not seen Jesus. You love Jesus. And even though you do not see Jesus now, you believe, you believe, you believe, you believe. Although I don't see my husband changing now, I believe. 
Although I don't see my wife changing now, I believe. Although I don't see my health changing now, I believe. Although I don't see my finances changing now, I believe. Although I don't see my dreams changing now, I believe. I believe. I believe. And so I come in here and I praise and I worship just like I believe. Get up and give the Lord an I believe you praise. Go. Give him an I believe you praise. Get up, please. Get up, please, and give the Lord an I believe you praise. It takes vision. It takes vision. The ability to see the unseen. Hallelujah. We must learn to see Jesus through the eyes of our heart, with the eyes of faith. Once we learn to do this, we can pray and prevail and march with confidence. Why? Faith sees, listen, faith sees the completion of the promise even before it's finished. Faith sees the completion of the promise even before your human eyes can see it happen on earth. Faith sees it happening in the supernatural. Somebody shout vision. And so now you understand Hebrews 10, 23. Look, look. Now Hebrews 10, 23 is talking about what Jesus has shown you. It's talking about looking through vision. It's talking about looking through the eyes of faith and believing God. So it says there in Hebrews, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Let us hold back fast the profession of what we see, not what is going on now but what we see the vision that God has given us let us hold fast of that profession not this one but that one beyond this one that's what that scripture is talking about friend hold fast to it you know what's another word how many how many can give me another word for hold fast prevail that's what we've been talking about for eight nine weeks hold fast don't let go. Bulldog faith. When that bulldog bites, it's not going to let go. That's the way our faith ought to be. When we bite into a, a word from God and we bite into a promise from God, we're not going to let go until it comes to pass. As a matter of fact, we're going to stand before God and say, God, because of your word, I'm not letting you go till you bless me. Hey, you won't do that. You'll humble yourself and you'll lay down, although you hear this teaching, and you'll lay down because you believe that, that if you lay down and let the devil run all over you, you're holy. You're not holy, you're dumb. Because some religions have taught us that the sicker and the poorer we are, the closer we are to God. Well, I don't know about you. I talk about it because I was brought up with that line of thinking. So I can talk about it. You got to shake that, man. You got to shake that. Because your God, according to Ephesians, your God can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ask or think. Do I have any big thinkers in the house? God can do more than that. Hallelujah. So hold fast to the profession of our faith. Without what? Come on, read the scripture. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Say vision. Shout vision. Without what? Without what? Why should we not wa waver for? Come on. Why should you not waver? For he is faithful who promised. Who is it that promised? Who is it that promised? Who is it that promise? Is he faithful? Does he keep his promises? The word says his promises are yea and amen. The word says his promises are yea and amen. Is he faithful? Then why waver? Why quit? Why give up? Why? Why? I mean, we just read, hold on to that profession. Don't quit. Don't waver. Well, it's hard. Yes, it's hard. That's why it's prevailing prayer. 
spiritual warfare prayer. But don't waver. Because he will give you that vision. Yeah. He's faithful. There's one thing I've learned about God. He really thinks he's God. And you know what I found out? He is. And there is no other God like him. Hallelujah. I said, there's no other God like him. So when God gives you the vision of the victory, say vision of the victory. Or when God gives you the vision of the desired end result, you have something to pursue. And that's why the Bible says, write the vision down in your journal. Write down every time you see God move to bring you closer to the, to the vision. Write it down. Stop and think on the vision. Then you begin, then thank God for bringing it to pass every single day. Well, I don't see it yet. Thank Him for it anyway. Thank Him for it today. It might come by tomorrow. Tomorrow you thank Him and you thank Him and you thank Him and you thank Him. Why? Because you're prevailing. You're prevailing. Prevailing, you're prevailing in prayer. Somebody shout amen. amen. Let's go to the next step. The next characteristic of prevailing prayer. What time is it? Okay. Your victory must be in your heart, not only in your head. You know, when people quit on, on quote, prevailing prayer, they think they're prevailing. It's because... It was just in their head, not in their heart. Listen to me. Write this down. Mark eleven twenty four 24 says this. Whatsoever you desire. In your heart, believe that you have received it and you shall have it. The word desire, you know what the little word for the word desire is? Burning desire. That's something you'll desire tonight and forget about it in the morning. When you have a burning desire, it births prevailing power. A burning desire births prevailing power. You may want to write that down. Luke 6.44 is a good example of that. Luke 6.44 or 6.45. A good man, you know the parable. A good man, say good man. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up Where? Where? Your vision's got to be in the heart. It can't be here. It's got to be in the heart. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. Why? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. You can't have a vision. You can't have a vision of succeeding. And I talk about it. You can have a vision of being healed. And all you talk about is being sick. You can't. If you really have a vision about being restored, that's what you talk about because that's what's really in your heart. Now, I'm not saying you ignore the symptoms. I'm just saying you don't put the symptoms above the word of God. Because it's the word of God and the promise of God and the vision of God that's going to change the symptoms. Well, thank you for your enthusiasm. Are, are, are you learning something? Look, look, look. A good man brings good things, uh, 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 brings out the good things stored up in his heart. What is in your heart? Why is that so important? Because, folks, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Here, you might start saying, well, you know, God said I'm healed. But here, you don't believe it. So what's going to come out eventually, what's going to come out eventually, maybe not in church because you know better, but when you're not in church, you know what's going to come out? That what's in your heart. Now, now, you can't preach or teach just this anywhere. They'll think you're nuts. Believe me, been there, done that. I should have bought the t-shirt. I didn't have enough money because they didn't believe in being blessed. Anyway, the heart, the heart. Look at Romans 10.10. 10. Look, for with a what? Come on, folks. For with a what? Say it again. For with a what? One believes. With a heart, one believes. With a heart, one believes unto righteousness. And after you believe with a heart, look what happens. And with a, and with a, 
Confession is made unto salvation. With the heart one believes, and with the mouth you confess that what you're believing. Isn't that phenomenal? Now that's just for our salvation. That's just for our salvation. And it works for everything else after our salvation. You're going to confess what you believe in your heart. What do you believe in your heart? Don't answer. It's just between you and God. Right now, honestly, right now, between you and God, what are you believing concerning any given situation you've been prevailing in? Because what you believe is what you're going to speak. I, I, I've been in, in, in ministry, two, in full-time ministry two years. Liar, liar, pants on fire. I, I don't want to say 30-something years because my wife will correct me every time. So I'll just say over 30 years. Is that good? I'm in full-time ministry over 30 years, and I've learned. I didn't set out to learn this. It just came to me. I've learned, I can tell more or less where people are in their faith just by listening to their conversation. Oh, now, see, now most of you are going to come up to me and just talk faith and, 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 <laughs> but, but God knows your heart. Remember, you use that against me, so I'll use that against you. God knows your heart. <laughs> Just by what they speak. Or you go to that mechanic and he's working under your car. All of a sudden the wrench slips and he scrapes his knuckles and he cusses. And he goes to your church. And you're there and he looks up. Oh, pastor, I didn't mean to say that. Yeah, you did because that's what's in your heart. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So you, if you don't want to say that anymore, get it out of your heart. Oh, man, I'm teaching. The Holy Ghost is teaching real good right about now. Huh? For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession of what you're believing in the heart is made. Here unto salvation, but in other situations unto healing, unto deliverance, unto completeness, unto success, unto breakthrough, unto miracles. You will, you will speak what is in your heart. That's why you have to guard your heart. You have to be careful what you allow into your heart because sooner or later, what you allow into your heart, you're going to start speaking. You must say, I must say it again. You must believe in your heart that you have the victory. How many of you believe you have the victory? Well, that's not very convincing, but let's go on. I don't have time. It's literally this way of thinking is literally a deal breaker if you don't. Unbelief is really coming into agreement. <laughs> you love me? Do you love me? Do I have more than six people that love me? Okay, I'm going to say it anyway. Unbelief is really coming into agreement with Satan's plan for you. How can you tell if it's in your, in your head and not in your heart? By the words of your mouth. By what you say, you can tell if it's really in your heart or just in, in, in your head. The words of your mouth tell you what you really believe. The words of your mouth tell what you really believe. The words of your mouth tell what you really believe. Before you can begin to make uh, to prevail and press in for victory you have to have it in your heart why is it so important because of this because once it's in your heart it's going to be spoken out of your mouth and your words listen to me please your words will bring about the reality of your vision in due season you will win Let me show you how important that is and how critical what you speak is. Let me show you Proverbs 18, 21. Let me show you what are the first three words there. Come on, everybody together. One, two, three. 
Stop. How many of you understand what death and life are? Amen? Look, death and life are in the power of your tongue. You're either going to speak life to the situation or you're going to speak death to the, it, it, it's up to you. This is just your words. And remember, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. That word is going to come out. You're either going to speak death or you're going to speak life according to what you believe by what you see. That's why you have to have a vision. You have to have a vision. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. If you love death, you're going to eat its fruit. If you love life, you're going to eat its fruit. What are you speaking? What are you speaking? What's in my heart? What's in your heart? What you see with the natural eye or with the eye of faith? I love the messenger translation. The messenger. Is it on there? Did I put it there? Yeah. Thank you, Charlie. You're welcome. Look at verse 21. On the count of three, can we read this real loud with a little bit of attitude? Can we? One, two, three, go. Words kill. Words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. Well, I couldn't help it. Yes, you can. If you have vision, you can help what you say. If you have no vision, you can't help it. You're only speaking what you're seeing in the natural eye. The things of God are not natural. The things of God are spiritual. Romans tells us that the natural mind cannot discern the things of the spirit. The things of the spirit, Romans chapter 10, the things of the spirit are foolishness to the natural mind. Vision, a vision from God is foolishness to the natural mind. And everything that you know up to this day in your life has all come. You've learned it all through your five senses. Smell, taste, um, uh, All those five senses, I don't have enough five senses, so pray for me. But everything you've learned, you've learned through all your five senses, and thank God. But when it comes to learning the things of God, you don't use your senses, you use your faith. For the just shall live by faith. Without faith, Hebrews eleven six. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For those that come to God must believe that he is God, and he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Faith. The eyes of faith. Words kill. Words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. So there are two basic principles for prevailing prayer in your words. You might want to write this down. I don't know if I put it on there, did I? Number one. Yes, I did. Charlie, you're awesome. I know, dude. I know. I dropped the microphone, but those people, demons back there, they yell at me. That's not, that they're not demonic. They look funny, but they're not really demonic. They're nice guys. There are two basic principles for prevailing prayer in your words. Write this down somewhere beside your mind. Number one, by your words you agree with God, or number two, by your words you agree with Satan, you choose. You choose. Death or life? You choose. And that's it in a nutshell. It's in a nutshell. Death or life? Say vision. Say it like it means. Say it like you mean it. You got to make your stand. I said you got to make your stand. How? Ephesians 6.13, put on God's complete armor. Therefore, put on God's complete armor that you may be able to resist and stand your ground on the evil day of danger. What's the evil day of danger? When whatever comes against the vision God has promised you. That's a dangerous day when the enemy starts throwing stuff like that and you start sliding towards the enemy. That's why you need the full armor of God. Stand your ground. Say that. 
Why do, you, why do you need the armor? That you may be able to resist and stand your ground on the day that those things come against the vision, on the evil day of danger. And having done all the crisis demands to stand firmly in your place. Say vision. Say it again. Vision. I want to close this out with this. Know who you are in Christ. Ooh, one of my favorite things. Know who you are in Christ. The authority of the believer is something that so many believers don't understand. They don't realize the level of authority that Jesus has purchased for us on that cross. But pastor, what is authority? Authority is being in a position to make decisions and take actions with full support of the governing body. What are you talking about? I'm glad you asked. Here's what I'm talking about. Say you're in, you're in traffic and a traffic cop steps in front of your car and holds his hand out for you to stay put. But you're already late for an appointment, really want to just speed right by him. What is it that makes you stop? His authority. His authority. He has the authority to put handcuffs on you and bust your Likewise, Jesus said, look at Matthew 28, 18. Likewise, Jesus said, Jesus approached and breaking the silence said to them, all authority, say all, say all, all authority, all power of rule in heaven and on earth, on earth too, on earth. Let it be on earth as it is in heaven. All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 19, go then and make disciples of all nations. That power and authority that was given to Jesus in heaven and on earth, in verse 19, is now given to us. You got to know who you are in Christ and carry yourself accordingly and think accordingly and speak accordingly. I know who I am in Christ Jesus. Nobody can write a book. Nobody has to preach and try to change my mind. It's too late. I've seen what God has done in my life. I know who I am in Christ. Luke 10, 19. I love this. Somebody shout, behold. Behold means check this out. Behold, the exclamation point, okay? Behold, I have given who? You. Okay, I'm going to read that, and where it says you, put your first name in it, okay? Okay? Personalize the Word of God. I've been teaching you that. Ready? Behold, I, I have given I have given, I have given authority and power to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power that the enemy possesses and nothing shall by any means hurt you, 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 you. And that's how you got to live. And that's how you got to carry yourself. You must know who you are in Christ. And begin to speak that. And begin to declare that. And so in closing this series, I want you to know that the surety of victory in prevailing prayer is understanding how much God loves you. Don't even break into prevailing prayer if the love that God has for you is not a settled issue in you. Because it's during prevailing prayer that the enemy will come in and try to tell you how unworthy you are. Come on, man, who do you think you are? Come on, you really think God is listening? You really think God hears you? 
What about what you did last week, man? What about what you did last year? Come on, dude. If you don't understand the unconditional love of God for you, those thoughts alone will break you and you will not prevail. You'll quit and you'll start saying to yourself, that's right, I am unworthy, man. I did all of that stuff. But listen to me, my friend. What you did is not who you are. I'm trying to show off the watch that Sister Lydia gave me a couple years ago for my birthday. I'm hoping that she'll give me one bigger, like... I can walk around. Anybody wonder what time it is? The love of God. You must understand the love of God for you. Give the Lord a praise. Come on, somebody give the Lord a praise. Come on, somebody. Give the Lord a praise. Come on, somebody give the Lord a praise. Come on. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Prevail, 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 prevail. Praise Him for the vision, the vision. Thank Him for the vision, the vision. It shall be just as God has said. It shall be, the Apostle Paul said, just as God has said. I know it looks like we're drowning, and I know it looks like the boat is falling apart, but brethren, he said, I'm here to tell you, it shall be just like God has promised. Now, now you're putting on some gear. Now you're getting ready to get out there and cut a giant's head off. You know what was so insulting about that battle? It was a tremendous insult for the person that defeats you to kill you with your own weapon. And David took that giant's weapon and cut his head off. Turn to your neighbor and say, he should have quit while he was ahead. Tell him he should have quit. But he didn't. And David took care of some business. No weapon for it against you shall prosper. There is no weapon that has more authority than her. There is no weapon that has more authority than what God has given us. So pick your head up. I said, pick your head up. Get that spring back into your walk. Walk into school tomorrow. Walk into work tomorrow. Go back to the office tomorrow. Have a different attitude. Put a smile on your face. And when that ugly person has been talking about you, walks in the office, just say to yourself, last night I cut your head off. Don't say it to them. Just say it to yourself. Huh. You're the one, I cut your head off, dude. I didn't only beat you down, dude, but I cut your head off with your own sword. And then look at him and say, good morning, how are you? Because now you have authority. You understand your authority. That's been yours all along over 2,000 years ago. Even while you, before you ever lined up to the things of God, God said, I'm going to make you a person of authority in heaven and in earth. Give the Lord a praise. You may be seated. A few announcements that will be dismissed. Amen. Amen.